You can hear me, right? <laughs> anyway, um, people have the agenda. Are there any things that we want to add to it or not? Uh, Pete, you, you were suggesting something that we need to consider. Um, I was suggesting that we have um, for item, sorry, for item 4A, we have three fairly lengthy presentations about the various overlay districts and tree codes. I'm prepared to present them all. It would take about, I estimate, 15 to 20 minutes to get through each of the three, one, three presentations. I think most important for the one tonight would be the discussion of the natural resources overlay district. Mm -hmm. So if you're, are they on? Oh, okay. I'm not listed on the thing here. I know. I've, tr I've talked to the city clerk <laughs> about that already. Sorry, it's the city recorder about are that. You, Sorry. Are you not able to open it? I'm not listed on here. Well, you're not listed yeah, on we've got be, you be it. Be somebody else. Should I be? Should I you're, be? You're logged in as a guest. I'm logged in as a guest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, Doug, that's up to you. Um, yeah. Um, for, for one thing, we do not have a quorum here. Uh, and so uh, perhaps, perhaps we should just deal with one of these. And uh, overview of the natural resource uh, overlay district and so forth. I think is really um, does does this include our wetland overlay? It includes an overview of the policy, and okay. in item four B, we'll be discussing the Kenema wetland issue. Because this more this detail. is this yeah. is a really crucial. Well, that's that specific uh, case, but the uh, general review is important for us to go before the. Uh, city Commission in terms yeah. of goal setting so so I'll be describing how the regulation is supposed to work and how the uh, uh, give an example of how the overlay is applied in various types of properties yeah and uh, I would um, perhaps not doing the discussion of the, of the Kanima wetland regulatory concerns but go to go ahead and uh, uh, permit the public after we've t talked about this one to introduce issues that we we can include the time so uh, Paul I'm sure you, you you have something to say there so what we could do is we could go ahead and talk about the over uh, the the overview of the uh, overlay districts and uh, then have you speak if you wish and then we'll bring that into our next agenda in terms of a more formal discussion if that's okay With, uh, with that, well, we can see how it goes. Does anybody else have an opinion as to whether we go through all the items today? My concern is we don't, we only, there's only the three of us. Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to expedite the meeting. Okay. And this first presentation is primarily focused on the natural resources overlay district, well, and it has right. links to other, other things, but it'll be a good introduction. Well, before we go into that, are there public comments on uh, non-agenda items from the public? Non-agenda items? They're just concerned about what all you're going to be talking about in this regulation because they're new to the... To Do you okay. want to have them well, um, well, no. If, if that's the case, though, it, it, it is tied to our agenda. And so, and so we can bring you in after we've had this initial discussion. I think that's the best to go through the initial discussion. Right. Kind of the, the so we'll, we'll have you come in and speak after we, we have this presentation, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll start in. So the, uh, the, f the Natural Resources Overlay District um, is in our city code under Chapter 1749. It's uh, an overlay district is a is a regulatory district that kind of floats over the top of the base zone. So all of the uses in your base zone are permitted, be a residential district or commercial district, whatever zoning's underneath. And then if you have a regulatory overlay, in this situation, it is designed to function independently of the of the zoning. Just just one moment if I can. Pete. Yeah. You get so she can get it on. Technologically oh, challenged. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You flip the toggle over? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that one. Mute. Um, okay. So we call it the NROD or NROD 
uh, for short. Um, we're a metro city, so our code has to comply with Metro Title Three and Metro okay. Title Thirteen, um, as well as other metro codes. But um, Metro Title Three is the water quality um, code for metro. We're a metro city, so we implement that locally. And Metro Title Thirteen is the habitat component or nature in the neighborhoods, and we implement that lo locally. We uh, are required to adopt a conservation area map, and that has to regulate what Metro deems to be significant habitat within the Metro urban growth boundary. And in our case, we have a combined overlay that functions to protect both Title III and Title XIII uh, resources. Um, this was adopted and updated from the old Water Resource Overlay District in 2010 and renamed to NROD. Title 13 also has other non-regulatory aspects, which are all des designed to incentivize uh, protection of natural resources in the urban area and promote habitat-friendly de uh, development practices. And then you also have to go through your entire code and look for any regulatory barriers that might prohibit um, a habitat-friendly development practice, such as allowing a skinnier street than you would typically require in a sensitive area, and those kinds of things. So that, that was done, um, and sorry. Um, when you read the code, there are use definitions for what is prohibited, exempt, or there are development standards for new development. There are specific standards that apply to utility lines and trails, rights of way, storm water, there are things called disturbance area limitations where you have, and I'll discuss this a little more later, uh, where you have a pre-existing lot that is, has a right to build on, um, but it is entirely within the overlay district, and so um, it's going to affect that habitat. So there's a cap on how much development can occur in those situations. And then it also has to provide a process for both clear and objective review or discretionary review. And by clear and objective review, basically we're talking about having a code where everybody can understand what it says. The mitigation requirements are clear. Um, it's basically a staff level review process. And if you're going to ver uh, modify those standards or ask for a deviation from those standards, it's a discretionary decision and it's made by the Planning Commission. And uh, so there is a process for that as well. There's also a process by which a person can verify the map. So how does the review work? The first step is an applicant due diligence. They're interested in development. They're interested in building something. They find out if the property has an NROD flag on it or is affected by the NROD. Um, they ask questions at the planning department and get initial information. And if they decide to move forward, we have a pre-application conference followed by a formal land use application. And this typically involves first a site-specific delineation of the mapped resource to determine exactly where that resource is on the property. And then a determination of the width of a required vegetative corridor buffer, and this is what the code does. Um, the ac applicant provides a plan and reports that identify those impacts as well as a mitigation plan and a report, and that consists of replanting and monitoring. Um, the city has a consultant that reviews what the applicant submits, and then there's public notice and comment. So we usually publish for 14 days the land use notice. We send notice to the Natural Resources Committee, to all the neighborhood associations and to any other group that's entitled to receive notice. And then we issue a staff report and a recommendation or a staff report and a decision, depending on whether that review is a type two staff level review or a type three discretionary review. Um, so what goes into the NROD map? Um, several things. There's the 1999 wetland inventory, the local wetland inventory. Our water quality resource area map, which was adopted um, in 1999. The city's slope data um, or LIDAR data, because that affects where the buffers go. Um, 
the Metro Regionally Significant Habitat Map, and that is based on aerial photograph taken in 2002. Um, so it may not reflect current conditions. There's a National Wind Wetland Inventory, which was published even earlier in 1992. And then we have various other documents that either have what we call natural resource inventories associated with them, like concept plans, and those update the NROD. Now, the NROD applies only to properties within the NROD map as adopted by the city commission and amended from time to time. Um, the adopted map is based on those documents, and the city applies a GIS-based buffer based on that assumed corridor width. So the corridor width is 50 feet for wetlands and perennial streams and 200 feet for uh, large drainages that drain into salmon-bearing streams like Clackamas and, and Willamette, <laughs> and their tributaries as well. Like um, cool. like properties that. are flagged with a Y. Uh, we have, uh, if the NROD buffer touches them and that may not reflect existing conditions, the applicant is required to verify their location and delineate that vegetative corridor as a part of their review. If a new wetland, and I'm going to go into this in a little more detail now, if a new wetland is discovered that is touching the map boundary, the city's review process applies and applies the buffer. If the you, new wetland. Can, can, can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, I'm I think it's relevant. Slide. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the critical thing you're asking about. Or, if the new wetland is completely outside of the map boundary, the city's review process does not apply and then Army Corps of Engineers or, and or D, Department of State Land Permits would, may apply in either case. Um, and what the code requires is that expressly only those resources that are either entirely or partially mapped uh, are regulated. And then um, if in the course of development review, evidence suggests that a property outside the NROD may contain a wetland or other protected water resource, the provisions of the chapter shall not be applied to that review. However, it doesn't excuse the applicant from satisfying any state or federal wetland requirements. So what the state and requirements regulate is the wet part of it, not the buffer. Um, and what the city requires is an impact associated with the vegetative corridor and, um, and the mitigation associated wet with that. So that means that even though we don't regulate the wetland today, DSL and the Corps may regulate it as well as any waterways that feed it. We don't have any say on how Department of State Lands goes about its determination of whether there's a water of the state determination. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because this is really relevant to things that have been brought before us here. Yeah. Uh, if, <clears throat> if somebody wants to bring into play the state regulations and so forth, uh, is there and there's a feeling that the city hasn't addressed that. Is it appealable to the state, or how does that work? Um, well, any land use decision is appealable at some level. Uh, a natural resource application is appealable. It, if it's a Type 2 application, is appealable to city commission. It has to be based on the code. And, and uh, if the appeal determination is that the community development department applied the code m properly, then the staff recommendation or the attorney recommendation would be to deny the appeal. However, um, then if some if somebody wants to change the code, that's typically a regulation, a uh, legislative process, right? right? Um, and a legislative process can have a fairly lengthy timeline or a fairly short timeline, depending on how many properties are involved. Typically, legislation at the, that affects city code is uh, affecting the city or large portions of it, and that's why it's a legislative application. Um, and then if it's an indiv individual property, hypothetically, yeah, you could do a legislative application for an individual property, but you get into issues of private property regulation and consent by the property owner and that sort of thing. Um, once an application for land use is submitted to the city, then the city is not allowed to change the goalposts. Um, so in uh, the Kanema example, 
we had an applicant who had not applied for a land use action yet, but did do work prior to that. And a stop work order was issued. And we're, that's the next item on the agenda. Um, as an example of that, so did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say there's a, mm -hmm. let's say uh, the DSL uh, delineated a, wet, uh, right. a wetland area. It, it wasn't included our maps. A, uh, a citizen felt that uh, it wasn't meeting the DSL requirements and the mm -hmm. Planning Commission had, well, whatever body, be it a, be it, be it a type two or type three, however it might go, and uh, mm -hmm. they felt that the city had not done the due process and so forth. Can they appeal that decision to the state? Um, or do you know? Can yeah. I chime in here? Yes, absolutely. So I just want to highlight the fact that the city regulates vegetated corridors. Right. We never regulate the feature itself. Right. So only itself. DSL and the core are regulating what they regulate. <laughs> we refer people on to them. So it, whether it's in our overlay or not, we'll never regulate the actual feature. The, the only question where we come into play is, is there a vegetated corridor buffer around that feature? And so if there is an issue with the determination from DSL or the core, we're not really part of it because we don't regulate that. We just, our duty is to make sure that if we think that there is a wetland, we tell them and that they, we keep communication with those agencies, mm -hmm. but we don't um, comment or um, have a chance to review what their determinations are. Can I repeat that for a second? As I understand it, what you just said was that if the, if uh, a wetland or some other feature is found by the public or whatever, your job is to report that to the core and DSL mm -hmm. for them to interact with the situation. Um, yes, if we think okay. that there is a feature, then we let them know. Right. Mm -hmm. But is it your job to uh, determine the wetland? Nope. No, that's DSL's and the right. core's job. And how does that impact the timing of the development? If um, if it's in our overlay district, we won't issue permits until everything is sorted out. If it's not in our overlay district, we just don't have any jurisdiction because um, we don't regulate features, and they do, and if they said something does or doesn't exist. Um, Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's because I mean this is one of the things that's triggered this discussion. Uh, it, it come, I need you to have anybody that wants to speak to this to come forward, name and all that good stuff. Yes, <laughs> Paul Edgar Kanima. So when we take a look up the map up there, uh, the what's interesting this lot of record outside of Enrod right there uh, has. If right where outside is and going up that hill, going, to, no, not that way, the other way, Pete, uh, right on the, the, the message there is the old Kadima Waterworks. It's right in this area, right in here. And so the water is flowing down and the, and the whole hillside is saturated to a point where you can see the water right on top of the soil coming out of the old Kadima Waterworks tanks. And it flows down into there, into the, it creates the, wa the wetlands that's been delineated by DSL right there. But then when it flows out of that, it flows towards where this, uh, uh, go to the left right there, straight down. There's kind of a, it goes into a pocket where they, there's a, uh, this, the built owners of the property cut, a, a, put a, a pipe through there to collect the water that was coming out of the wetlands so uh, they could have during times when there's more minimal flows it, if it gets to high flow that whole basin there one time got to 15 feet deep back in the 1994 floods mm -hmm. and, and so in there that if the water was so great that it flooded over Miller Street and then down so you see the house at 421 yep right there it went right between that and straight down the hill along that way and uh, 
because the water, the, the water, there was so much water in the ground that couldn't handle it in place. And then, so the house at 514 Fifth Avenue or Fourth Avenue, right there, had this whole basement flooded. The next one down, these houses through there, uh, it, the water got so great. Now this is all water that's percolating out the hill down there. So recently, the guy at 514 uh, took a big grater into there, into a, a place where it's waters of the state, and graded the whole area down. And but it's because it's not in Enrod, and it's not, but it's still waters of the state and it's important habitat. But if it's like cutting a tree down, it's on your private property. Why don't you do it early before anybody is looking over your shoulder? And and so when we have an area like this that's not regulated or not identified, it just opens it up to significant opportunities for abuse of critical habitat. Uh, there's The water goes down next to the house at uh, five, uh, whatever, 14 or whatever, or five old, or six old down, further down there. And oh, yeah. it comes out onto Fourth Avenue. And uh, they recently put a pipe there to collect it there because it used to go clear across the street and straight down this unimproved road. And, that was, and that's a historic creek bed for all of the water coming from the Kanema Waterworks. And uh, it's the way it's been directed and, and stuff. But I look up there and I see, woo, this thing that none of this area is under Enrod uh, mapping. And yet, uh, it, it's it, it's uh, an area, and the whole hillside up there above there, where they going along here, uh, John Lewis and and lidar had identified as high highest susceptibility to landslides, and I don't see any mapping on that. Well, there's a separate overlay for that. We're going to talk about it. But right. but yeah. again, yeah. we. So these areas right along through there are, are very, very active. And, and our concern is, is that how do we get the NROD overlays onto those areas so that where we know that there's, everybody knows that, that there's water and, and, and the soils are, are really bad. And, and, and this is an area where the deer play and and when they when they were play, playing around with that lot that's of river, <coughs> the pipe down there, all of a sudden we're looking down in the pipe and the water coming out of that wetlands was all brown. With just minimal work cutting away and playing with the buffer, the the amount of silt flow going down there was uh, was identifiable as serious with minimal stuff. And so we say, okay this buffer is really important. Uh, how do we get ourselves where we have a buffer? And it's kind of like the logic of saying, all of us that care about fresh water, about the habitat, about doing what's right, we know we need to, we need, we need to improve upon the mapping and the overlay uh, to make sure that we're doing it. And if we don't have it, what, what does it take for us to to expand the overlay mapping across it. Well, I think that's that's one of the goals that we're putting forward is to mm -hmm. look at the look at the overlay districts again where where there have been identified things. Right. That's that's a major public process, though. I mean, it's, an, it's I, the, the commission wouldn't even act on it without going through a major public process. <clears throat> the Miller Street House the lot of record outside Enrod on this drawing that we have in front of us and up there <clears throat> by the bow of Miller oh, Street. Same one. Yeah. Is that is that a delineated wetland now because of DSL's work? The, the the DSL report delineated it, and so the state has now identified. All right. So it, they, they, they did wetland. their work because it's but, outside the Enrod. But they have no buffer. Yeah, right. We understand that. Right. So they have no buffer. And so, and there's no subsequent buffer for the waters of the state going that feed out of it. 
And, and so that allowed somebody to go in and do something that if it was in an Enron area, they wouldn't be allowed to do. If that's my understanding. Yeah, they can't develop within the wetland. But they, but can't, they could uh, hypothetically develop but in But if I take the drainage buffer. that goes yeah. right out of it, mm -hmm. this kind of mm -hmm. basin. So what, what is not happening if the development were to move forward? What would not be applied is the buffer, the impact analysis, and the subsequent replanting and mitigation for the, for the buffer. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean that the developer doesn't want to, you know, protect the wetland in some manner, but the city's regulations wouldn't apply. Other things are going to be come to bear, stormwater analysis, drainage, soil conditions, that are all going to affect that development. Um, but, you know, they're not going to be able to build in that wetland because DSL won't allow it to. So... Um, I also should point out that if you are um, within the Enrod boundary, so these other two examples, here you have a lot of record within, entirely within the boundary, which has what I referred to earlier as a maximum disturbance area limit. They've got to do the impact analysis and they've got to do replanting, but they're allowed to develop. They're just not developing right up to the edge of this wetland here, this brown blob. Um, and in this situation over here, you have a partial overlay where a person could hypothetically, and I've got a, a person could hypothetically locate a building footprint outside of the Enrod buffer. Um, and then whatever, whatever impact they do still have requires mitigation, but it's a strategy of avoidance, first and foremost, yeah. followed by mitigation yeah and impact includes all Sorry. disturbance areas so it also includes obviously pervious surfaces but it also includes gardens I mean it includes a variety of things not just homes right and impervious surface is defined in our code that, so, this lot uh, a lot of record right there is I'm 211 right there and that lot of record right there right uh, at the corner left of the green area was the first, there's an indentation there, and it was the first house built for a federal judge for the Oregon Territory. Right. And so when the developer built those houses, the, the developer wanting to make sure that he eliminated any problems took a cap to the whole area and leveled the whole thing out before anyone said anything. And, 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 and this sure. was, and no one, and so this is a house built in 1845 or 40 uh, before Oregon became a state for the first judge was right there. Right. And, uh, but they didn't demolish the house. They just graded the, house the land. The house was gone. But, the they, was but gone. they wanted to get rid of the foundation and any records of what the house was like. Uh, as soon as they could, mm -hmm. so that they would have better opportunities to develop the property. Right. And and so when you get into this idea of saying, okay, yeah, I know that, but uh, I just worry about if we don't, uh, how we get our overlays over mm -hmm. it, we identify what's important. Kanema being the only National Register Historic District, and having more, should have greater thinking. And I, all I'm hoping is, is that if we can somehow streamline how we can be proactive. This I'll, I'll pose a question. Somebody's doing a grading. Do they require a grading permit? Yep. Cubic Yards does. Um, in a situation where they're just clearing brush and not removing trees over six inches diameter and or doing invasive species removal, those are permitted without any kind of review. Um, but we advise applicants who are going to do that kind of work to get an erosion control permit from Public Works and uh, to make sure that if there is any issue with erosion control, because if you're just scraping the very top surface of the, 
of the soil and taking the brush off that's like blackberries or ivy, you know, that's considered okay. Um, but when you start digging into the soil surface is when it triggers a, re a real erosion control potential. And, that, and that's what happened in this situation was that the person was advised to get the erosion control permit. They didn't. Uh, city issued a stop work order. Department of State Lands issued a violation um, based on a complaint. And that's when the work ceased uh, until inspections could be done. The, the developer was required to do a de delineation and submit it to the Corps of Engineers, sorry, the DSL, and they did that, and that's what's been recorded. Um, and then they, um, they said that the violation no longer existed because the de delineation was done, and they've been advised that no further work could continue without a grading or fill permit from issued by them and any, any subsequent permits that the city would require. So, yeah. The thing is, when you see something that you think that would be a violation, you do report it. Right. And, uh, and the city has to respond. Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of like now that the people with that lot are uh, down here, this lot here, they're, uh, they're not doing anything, but the guy next <coughs> door is. Okay. And he's a historic uh, property owner. Now, whether what he did is good or bad, I don't know. But it's his private property, and I can't walk onto his his private property and examine. All I know is I could the I can see the cats out there, going at it, and I I know that when I see the water turn brown down at the, <coughs> down at the other end where the pipe when the water comes out, and these are waters of the state, as identified by by DSL. Does waters of the state Mm -hmm. then when that waters of the state flows into a little coffee creek. Well, I did, well, I, I did talk to, to uh, I'm trying to connect the, the jurisdictional I, oversight. Yeah, I contacted the, D the DSL about this because of your question. Um, and they said that, you know, potentially they could be, they would be waters of the state, but they have, somebody has to delineate it for them to make that determination. So if it's a tributary that's flowing into what they've already <coughs> delineated, i.e. the wetland, yes, um, that hasn't been delineated yet. So that- well, The water flowing out of it has not been delineated? According to the DSL. But the yeah. water in mm -hmm. the wetlands is waters of the state. Yes, and then they would say, Potentially it is, but they didn't look at the tributary to make that determination. <clears throat> I would yeah. say if you mm. see anything, just call yeah, it in. And then exactly. they'll go do a site visit and assess right. to see if something's wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I would approach it. <clears throat> the magenta pattern, which is your inrod boundary, how, how did that come into being? Is that um, like I said, that's the city's GIS buffer. Yeah. Um, it's based on all of those documents that I talked about earlier okay. um, applied using LIDAR data. Okay. So what you're seeing here is the GIS, this brown I image is the wetland from okay. the local wetland inventory from okay. 1999. Then you have a slope next to it um, and a 50 foot buffer. And the 50 foot buffer does not if you're if you're below a very steep slope, 25 percent or more, the 50 foot buffer um, is not regulated until there's a break in slope. So it can it can go up to 200 feet sometimes if you've got a slope that goes that far. So seems yeah. like what's needed here is some incentives for the people to do what we want. What <clears throat> would be well, that's what the review process yeah. is for. Yeah. But I mean, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone's ever, I don't know that exists anymore, the Riparian Tax Incentive Program, Fish and Wildlife offered to people. Mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is a way through the review process to provide, to, you know, if, you, if you've gone through the process and you've done your impact mitigation, the city requires that that area be protected by a covenant a deed restriction or a tract of some kind. 
Okay. And then that property is essentially non-developable and can have a different tax rate. Now, the property owner can go and go to the tax assessor and say, look, I've got a... I've got an area of my property which the city has said is off limits to development, and here it's been approved as a water resource area. You okay. can reduce my taxes on it. So that's something you guys established in Oregon Well, city. we would give them the land use decision, and it's up to the owner to go to the assessor okay. and make that and, and ask for that. But reduction. it's your yeah. tax incentive program the city has made available. Anybody can go to the Clackamas tax assessor with yeah. a local land use decision and make that claim. And it wouldn't yeah. also it wouldn't have to just be a natural resource overlay district area it could be something like this which is outside the boundary but has wildlife value it could be that it could um, the typical requirement is that there be a steward i.e. somebody who <coughs> is legally entitled and agreed to take care of that area steward okay either the property owner yeah. or a third party such as a wildlife organization right. or the city and frequently those areas will overlap with steep slopes and something mm -hmm. like that yeah. This, mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, I would just, I think that the, this Edrod map that's there is very arbitrary and I'm trying to figure out uh, how it was originally drawn at that area because I know all the area going down yeah. it, to, the, to the left of it uh, is, uh, is much the same. Well, or equal or, or, or greater. It's, well, you, you it's got, fairly... You boundaries around the... the uh, Pardon? You have a certain length boundaries you use to set the... Uh, the yeah, the vegetative corridor, which is prescribed in the code based on the resource, what, whether it's a wetland, a perennial stream, an intermittent stream, and the area that it's draining above it. And it goes from anywhere from 15 feet for an intermittent stream, which doesn't flow year-round, to 50 foot, which is typical for yeah. a perennial stream or a wetland, to well, 200 the, feet, and, one of the, and one it's of based the on the slope as well. One of the in issues yeah. that applies to intermittent streams, mm. that, uh, oftentimes they flow heavier uh, with, with storm events. Right, and, and it, so it, it's based on the Corps of Engineers methodology if it's wetland, so mm. that's in the code. So you well, have to how could we get these, how can we mm. expand the map to be more reflective of, of reality? through either submitting a legislative file to the city and having a, having a delineation done and approved and the NROD expanded to and, and amending the map, basically, and then getting that approved through the city commission. As, Can as you repeat that file. again, Pete? I didn't it, would be a, it would be a legislative review process. Okay. With a go that to, a homeowner or series of owners? Well, can, can, the, yeah. can, can the Natural yeah. Resources Committee uh, be empowered to be the vehicle to, to, to start this action? I would, I would guess not. Uh, I mean, you're, you're describing the problem to us, uh, but the neighborhood itself, uh, association itself could make a request, could it not? Anyone can apply for an application, but the, the difficult part about it is paying the fees and getting the studies and doing the work. So if the, if to go through the process, mm. we'll process whatever comes to us. Hey, but if 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 the lady back here is the vice chair of the neighborhood, I'm the land use chair. You don't even have to be associated with the neighborhood. But you but can, can if we if we apply as a neighborhood association, we don't have to pay a fee. That's incorrect. You have to pay a fee. You um, our code does not allow that. You can ask for the city commission to do a general fund subsidy for applications, but there is always a fee. So it's who pays the fee. What would the covers, fees typically be, would you think, on something like this? Uh, special review. It depends on how much additional work is left to do delineation and how many properties it affects. Yeah. Um, but the review fee for the city is... Um, a few thousand. A few thousand dollars. <coughs> do you also uh, have to amend Metro title maps? Uh, we don't know the answer to this question yet, but if the city amends our natural resources map we have to provide notice to metro and metro may that may be adequate <coughs> um, Excuse me. and that they keep a record of that because they're used to seeing local governments amend maps that are still in compliance with title three and title 13. i would like to check that though mm -hmm. okay. yeah 
Is this a, a place or an example of a place where we could ask for a Metro uh, Nature in the Neighborhood grant to, uh, to help fund um, yeah. this uh, delineation and, and uh, yeah. as a vehicle because of Actually, our desire to protect the water and the, and the natural resources? I, it would depend on Metro. I mean, yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I yeah. really think that would, I, you know, I've seen other grants submitted that were for general planning purposes, such as your trail extension. Which were trail enhancement and length, <coughs> lengthening, but uh, but my guess is Metro would want all the property owners to agree to it. Yeah, I mean, it's well, a, and there may be property owners there that say, "Oh, uh oh, this will yeah uh, limit then, my ability to develop my land. Yeah. Therefore, I don't want to agree." I, mean, I think when you get a nature in the neighborhoods grant, you're getting something that you can implement right then and there. And if you got a neighborhood as so. Uh, neighbors that are not interested in you doing yeah. that. I'm not. I'm not sure how that metro would take it. Yeah, it, it, just the magenta area that I see flowing through here with my eyesight. <laughs> I see the grade grade uh, topo lines and all this. It seems to indicate a kind of a, a there a, a water movement. It's probably why it showed up on your. Well, it's in Kanima, as Paul says, it's. You have a combination of stream corridors as well as yeah. springs and wetlands. And yeah, you got really, lots of springs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it becomes fairly amorphous. Right. There's yeah. there's a house down on Fourth Avenue where they have a spring comes right out and they percolate the water <coughs> like it's like a, a, a coffee pot, and it yeah. just it, the water pressure coming it's out. It's an so artesian it, effect, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it just yeah. starts spurting right. straight up, right. and it's coming out. And it's all natural, yeah. you know. Uh, and it's just that much water pressure and that much water. Mm -hmm. right. And so, and it's not identified. So <laughs> it's not on your map. Yeah, but that's a special yeah. kind of uh, groundwater. That's pretty amazing, actually. Oh, it's, it's just yeah. that much. So, and, and in these areas where we have that much water and we also have Dogami's LIDAR coming down on it, and showing this the highest susceptibility to both shallow and deep landslides. Which is why you got all the percolation and, and we've got and so we've got all the grease. <laughs> so they'll the do geotechs, right? Yeah. I mean we'll know they'll do and, geotechs. But yet at the same time, uh, we are have a house going in down down by uh, f further to the left there right now, and they're cutting back into the slope. The back wall of it looks to be about fifteen feet high. And then there's a bunch of tear, tear crops on it. So from the back wall of the house cut in to going 20 feet away from it, you go up 40 feet in height from the floor of the, of the cut. Uh, so the degree of slope there is just amazing. And it's in a LIDAR uh, identified for, for landslides. But we allow it to go through. Well, if it's... If it's violating the geologic hazard overlay through illegal cut and fill, because there are requirements that cuts and fills within the geologic hazard zone, which is a different overlay that we we're going to talk about later, but um, then a code, code enforcement complaint can be filed and we'll do the investigation and see whether or not they, uh, the, yeah. You know, I, yeah. sometimes you, you, a guy is already, people have already got permits and they're building. And you know, this is not the time to go bang, bang. Well, to either myself or the no, building. but still, if they're violating the code, they could put a stop. Uh, well, there. but I the mean, city, the city approved it. Oh, well. and that's where. Well, we also get uh, in a type two approval. It's important to us to get all the overlays right, whether it's the natural resource overlay or the geologic hazards. And so, you'll mm -hmm. hear Pete talk about it too. But I mean, we don't rely on one person with a stamped engineer. We always rely on two. So we have the applicant does this report, and then. The city also, in in the, these cases, hires consultants to confirm that, and we go through a public review process. So we want as many eyes on it as possible, and that's why we email it to various every neighborhood association and the NRC and things like that. So we want people to keep looking at it because we want to get it right, and we want to make sure that it's okay. But there's sort of legal parameters if you have a if you have a legally established lot. If, the city says you can't put anything there then you know we have to kind of have to buy it at that point we have to allow something to happen on legal lots 
and it might be very small and it might not be in the in a great spot but you have to have something and but, we go through but because an I, a permit is issued doesn't mean that something is ha happening there that the city doesn't permit i mean i don't uh, i so, you know it, we're none so, of us so i mean that's that's the point you notify code enforcement to say if you we're, think in fact something's being violated i don't have that stamp of, of where i understand all of this thing to the degree where no, i can no. really but i i sent in a letter once on uh on a structure that was being built and a place that I didn't think was appropriate, they put a stop order on, uh, order on it. And mm -hmm. then they had to do some major mitigation around the disturbance that they did. So, I mean, a, a citizen can do it. But it would be so much easier and better for all of us. Uh, no, we understand, we, we understand to what you're the talking map, about. Uh, the map uh, to fully right. represent what is really no, should no, be. We, we understand that aspect of it. Right now you're dealing with things that are happening, happening right now. Uh, we, we, we're looking for uh, to have the water resource overlay lo looked at again. And, uh, but it, you know, and some of these concerns are probably what are triggering our interest, but that, that in itself is a process. I, I, can, do you have enough support within your neighborhood to approach a conservation strategy for for the areas that you're concerned about here other than taking somebody's right to build there's a it's all about taking is what I'm hearing here uh, is that there's you, a there I'm sure that there's a significant well concern. You, you folks and then others it sounds like you have a pretty strong coalition of interest I'm, it, I'm just suggesting it, just, it, it would I just would love to see us expand the mapping so that the NROD mapping truly reflects reflects the conditions well, that, that exist. That's what that's what I mean. That's what we're going to be requesting, and it's not only for your area, for other areas as well, to uh, to look where the delineations are. And we know that the we know that our maps are not complete, and, or I mean, we got more information available to us. But I mean, we can't do it just like that. I know. But see, this whole area was flat platted in 1865. Yep. Right. So, and they didn't worry about hills, creeks, or anything. They just yep. laid Land it of out. Opportunity. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to talk, come on forward to the mic. Okay. I do we want to give to a lot of credit to the neighbor. Sorry, yeah. um, to the neighbors and uh, McLaughlin Kinema Neighborhood Association as well because there is a lot of communication there to make sure that people are doing the right thing and we really appreciate it because we can't be everywhere all the time so it's nice to have um, people out there who will tell us information because a lot of times we just don't know so this is the reason these are the neighbors right on the hot spot you know where they're 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 affected and uh, so as you you take a look at it uh, uh, the house at uh, 502 right there, Miller, what, how, when was it built? Your house? Did 1867. And, uh, at, and uh, it's important. It's an 1867 house in, in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this stuff is happening in a manner that, uh, uh, you know, could change a lot of things and and we're trying to protect a historic national register historic district in a, in a responsible way not to be stupid people about it just about being responsible mm -hmm. but and what i hear our planning director talking about unless i'm wrong is that to initiate a process to expand the natural resource boundary which may be not what it should be it's still somebody's got to do the investigation. Somebody's got to come up with the assessment. Somebody's got to initiate the report. Then you folks have to respond to it. And so in that process, there's uh, professional time, unfortunately, involved on both ends of, you know, people that have to delineate it. And, and I think the other thing is people adopted this NROD boundary or accepted it probably without with a little bit of I'll bet I'll bet they're a little bit of concern from that they saw this on an overlay map initially because it affected their property values right yeah it was but up the to, city uh, the city established the zone through negotiation through a process with the property owners hearings. so yeah. now you're now what you you're asking to do which I understand is to expand it and be more inclusive of what's really there but somebody has to do that work that's the problem the rub here and uh 
And if, but if we don't do it, that we still open our open the door to to significant. Uh, well, we understand what you're saying. Abuse, and, uh, and when when it's uh, when it's really truly inappropriate, and we can see the results of it. And we're trying. All we're trying to do is say how do how can we approach this in the most responsible way? And I would love to see the uh, the Natural Resources Committee empowered to a. a a greater degree to be to, to help in this regard because I you guys well, are I mean what, what what we're what we're trying to do is get be, get before the commission to do uh, further uh, looking at our wetland uh, uh, overlays and and, and, I, and, I, and you have if you have additional delineated areas that we were not on original maps we need to look at those and but, I know but, that the but mayor we, is we, we are not empowered to do anything. Okay. Well, the you can planning the, commission is yeah. the net uh, the uh, um, historic uh, review, review board, board is, and the city commission is. We are not empowered to do anything. Okay. But any We're citizen not. can apply for any legislative application, and we'll take it. It's just a ma It's a matter of resources, right? It's a matter of resources. Yeah. But if you make a, if you uh, well, I, that, that's what I'm suggesting is that okay. uh, that, that that we look at these citywide. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, and uh, to go ahead and perhaps uh, contract some additional mapping of the natural resource area. But that is a process. And uh, Is there any groups or anybody out there that could help us in, 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 in facilitating or so, something we could do to make it more reasonable to happen? So that, you know, how, what is there... <coughs> Uh, well, if you compare it to the previous periodic review for the comprehensive plan, which was when I think the last water resource overlay district was adopted, correct me if I'm wrong. So that was 2004, and it was based on the 1999 local wetland inventory and some additional new mapping that Metro had done, because that's when we adopted Title III regulations or updated them. I don't know what it costs to go through periodic review, and normally periodic review is looking at all of your code and all of your policy, if, um, and it has to be acknowledged by the state when it's done. So, yeah. yeah. The reason, why, a lot of the reason why we don't go through and amend our code more often, just in a general statement, is because of the resources, because of the number of people we have to work, and also the cost of it so <coughs> sorry for an example the cost we have to mail we have to tell people when we're doing um anything that's going to affect their property value it makes sense right and so <coughs> sorry the cost to mail those little tiny postcards is over six thousand dollars alone let alone you know a year worth of process and studies and time and yeah. mm -hmm. Mark, Mark Riskadal comes to mind, Northwest Environmental Defense Center, and a student project to come up. So you are a, you're a national historic neighborhood yeah. district, and you have significance, and maybe approaching him, you, you, you know about that, Yeah. Right. Uh, and seeing if they would be willing to help with the, the delineation or other aspects at Lewis and Clark College yeah. um, might be a way to approach it. Uh, you know, um, I, I totally support what you're wanting to do, and I know Doug does, and I'm... I think we as a group yeah. do. The question is how to get it done. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and uh, in the meantime, you got some inc incursions in the area that you're worried about. I understand that. If you got turbidity issues, DEQ gets real upset about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, as one example. Virtually every property in Kanema that goes through the development review process is going to be subject to three different overlays geologic hazards. This one, Enrod, and the historic overlay district, which is the uh, historic review board review. So and there's, there's two, a lot two. of scrutiny involved, and those are Doug said. You know, it's all pers right. pursuant to adopted codes, um, yeah. and you're talking about carrots versus sticks to a huge extent. A regulatory approach to something where you may not be able to incentivize a property owner to, you know 
provide a full yeah. vegetative corridor width, but you, you can potentially encourage that. In the yeah. example you talked about, the, mm. the grading that was occurring, if your description is right, they were doing more than clearing brush. And the point is, you report it. Report it is who's, who's the best? You say quote enforcement? Um, we, oh, we take uh, code enforcement is good. We have OC request app. Um, there's a lot of avenues you can call us directly, um, but it is uh, it, it is a quick turnaround for these types of things. We normally drop everything when yeah. it's uh, associated with the stream or a slope and get yeah. out there to make sure yeah. that the, tree the hillside's not coming down, right? Uh, and then case, it goes to the this erosion. Case, well, there's a stream there, and it's not even mapped. We're aware of that. So, uh, but we spent, yeah. you know, weeks going out there to look at it and got worked with DSL to make sure that they understood what was going on and that they could get out there and take a look at it too. Um, but it has to, really has to be generated by a complaint. Yeah. But because the limited resources, that's about the only way we operate is by complaint driven requests of that nature. We're stuck in our cubicle for the if most we, part. So it's hard yeah, to see. If we, if, if we, if somebody made a, a complaint that we have a creek coming out of the wetland and it's being disturbed, then then you guys would have to have the responsibility to somebody yeah, yeah. would to come would. in and, 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 and delineate whether or not there is a creek coming out of the wetlands. Well, yeah. they, they, they would look at it and they felt that that was an issue they could yeah. ensure to stop work, yes. Yeah, when we became aware of this issue, it happened very quickly we had public works out there john lewis was there the erosion control office officer there martin montalvo our public operations manager they're all out there walking the site and the folks from dsl and in, in, in within the same two-day period wow so um and they were looking at where the erosion control fence had been put in improperly and correcting that looking at the level of ground disturbance, looking to see where the trees have been removed or not. So they were out there, yeah. But they never, mm. but they, that, they just went up on the wetlands delineation, period. They didn't, Correct. they didn't look past the wetlands where the water flows from the wetlands. Because our code states that. Our adopted code states that NROD review doesn't apply in that particular situation. The yeah. city yeah. has no authority. Yeah. No. And what you're asking for is a, another del a delineation and end rod, and that is a, that is a process unto itself. And, and we're going to be recommending that the city you just seems like look at it again. But yeah. I, I don't know what, what else we can do beyond that. It just seems like somebody like I mentioned, Northwest Environmental Defense Center, you're a very significant neighborhood, historic, extreme his history, back to the early 1800s. And if the general perception among your neighborhood is that you're concerned about this kind of stuff, I could see them maybe making this a, a, a um, case study and then helping you with bring the, some of the materials together. Um, and, and it would be good for our committee to be in, involved with that sure. process too. Sure. The, these are environmental lawyers in training, <laughs> and they're really good, you know, to have. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're hands-on people you know, where they're, where they're, they're goal is to protect the environment in a responsible way That's yeah. northwest environmental defense center at lewis and clark college yeah 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 i know this is frustrating but yeah <laughs> well it, it, does it back here have any thing to say no <clears throat> I'd be willing to go with you, Paul. You know, we visited them before, you know, yeah. and just see if they even thought it had legs. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay, you can go on with the presentation then. Uh, all right, um, I will. I will continue. Um, there are other other codes, and we're getting more into the tree regulation part of things now. And so, um, some of this you're very familiar with. We now have a revised heritage tree code and uh, the heritage trees and stands part of our code 12.32. Process was amended in 2014. We uh, expanded our list of eligible tree species uh, based on minimum 
diameter thresholds. Um, this is a process where a heritage tree requires owner consent. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make a request. Minimum yeah. diameter might differ from one species to another. A U, a U grows slowly, right? Yeah, right. right. So, so you might have a U that's <laughs> that big around, but it may be maybe oh, several years that's old. That's what you said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Y-E-W. Yeah, I think yeah, we no, have not Pacific. U. I mean, a U tree. Okay. I think so Pacific is, 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 uh, is, 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 <laughs> doesn't have a threshold on our code. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's I mean, there right. you need to get some more expertise involved, but the yeah. thing is that you... You could have a U that's a heritage tree, yeah, sure. been many years old, but that's it true. won't be determined by its by its, by diameter. its diameter. Yeah, oh. and I think the code provides for that already. Okay. Yeah, I had it a does. U tree. It doesn't. It's not just the threshold of diameter that uh, allows it to be eligible. It's no. it's meeting the actual heritage criteria. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. had a U tree on one of my sites up in Forest Park that I cored, and uh -huh. it was about this big around, and it was 80 years old. Phenomenal. Huh. So. Yeah. Well, it's still there. We haven't had <laughs> a nomination on a U yet. It may be hard to find. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, Do they have to be native trees? No, no, no. Okay. Um, we just have fact, a list. Most of the heritage trees that have been requested are have not yeah, been native trees. Yeah, we've had two Gary Oaks, a Ponderosa, and uh, a Douglas fir. So three natives and. Ponderosa, yeah, that same. Okay. No, we do. We do have. We do have ponderosas. Yeah, yeah. Valley, Native. valley, uh, pine, or whatever you call it. Oh. Um, so, and then we also have a process where, if land, if it's on public land, depending on who the public agency is, certain type of consent is required. If it's a city-owned property, then the city commission will make the final determination on it with a staff taking the recommendation forward to the natural resources committee for a recommendation to the city commission um, this process results in voluntary recognition and legal protection with covenant protection for the tree and today we have had well five trees nominated one died and actually yeah. fell over and, and so four now and waterboard park is a designated Heritage stand. Was the fifth tree the sugar maple? Yes. Oh. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Judge Ron Tom's property. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, next major section of regulation for, with respect to trees is our Tree Protection Code 1741. It's part of our It does not regulate trees in the public right of way. That is a separate code section. It, doesn't regulate trees in the natural resources overlay. That's what we just talked about. It's separately regulated. It allows for site development and tree removal with clear and objective options for mitigation, but it also promotes preservation. There are a variety of compliance options I was going to talk about, um, in addition to removal and replacement, including flexible setbacks, lot reduction incentives, fee in lieu and permanent protection so it applies when an application is submitted could you, could you back up I sure that slide. yeah okay so these are all potential yeah go ahead i'm not sure mm -hmm. we, we got tree protection does not regard trees in enron does that mean you can't have a you don't mean you can't have a heritage tree in enron right heritage tree is kind of a separate designation that applies, but it can yeah. you could have one in a within the over, overlay. You could certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Good question. Um, so this applies to typical site plan review as well as land division and other reviews. It applies to city capital capital improvement projects like uh, road widening, uh, Lynn Avenue corridor plan for when that gets implemented in phases if there's tree removal in the right-of-way or if the right-of-way is going to be expanded and it's going to result in tree removal then this chapter is going to apply to it um, through a type 2 review process with public notice and comment um, it applies where there's canopy removal on slopes greater than 25 percent um, and where canopy removal is more than 25 percent on that slope um, and so sometimes that's not something we know about until there's a complaint 
like we were talking about. Somebody says, there's somebody removing trees on the slope. We'll go out, inspect, look at how much is being removed and determine whether or not this is triggering a site plan and review under this code. It also applies to heritage trees and stands in terms of if that tree is removed um, uh, through a, you know, a process where an arborist makes a determination that the tree is either dead, diseased, dying, or hazardous, then the mitigation requirements of this section could apply. Um, how does it work? Um, there's several options. The typical option chosen by developers is what's called miti mitigation, which means removal and of trees and subsequent mitigation by replanting. All replanted and tree saved trees are protected by a restricted covenant of, that gets recorded. Second option, which we don't see very much, um, is where trees are placed in a tract for permanent protection. And along with that, there are incentives for setback reduction and lot size reduction so that somebody could get a density bonus for that, potentially. Um, and then having a restrictive covenant, if you are just building an addition on your house or doing a minor partition or something, this is an option. And then fee in lieu of planting. So if you are, you don't have enough room to plant all of the mitigation trees that are required under the code, you can pay into the tree mitigation fund. And that's the fund that we've used to leverage tree planting citywide um, fairly recently is in the last few years. How are the mitigation areas chosen, cash in lieu of? Um, it who does depends on the site. Uh, the the usually a report is prepared <coughs> by a certified arborist who's working for the developer, and they'll prepare something like this. As an example, on a on a subdivision, it's recently. I'm sorry, it's so small, but um, I'll kind of point out this is a table that's submitted as part of a set of plans. Um, where they've gone through, they've given every tree on the property that's greater than six inches a number, they've measured the diameter, um, they've given the species of tree, they have a comment on the condition, they've given it a health rating, a structure rating, they've determined whether it can be preserved or needs to be removed. They've determined then, based on our city code, whether it falls within a construction area or outside of a construction area. They determine whether, what the mitigation is that applies in that situation, and then they determine the number of tree mitigation, trees that are required. And here, the upper part of the table, you'll see this significant number of trees that the arborist would recommend and be preserved. Um, they're not within a construction area on the site, so there's no mitigation required, but they've got to protect those trees with a covenant. Lower down on the list, you see the recommendation for removal, uh, the falling within a construction area and the uh, resultant number of trees based on the diameter is given on the right side. Um, this is a very detailed tree mitigation plan for a recent subdivision submittal north of Holcomb Boulevard, 93 lot subdivision. And this is just a portion of the site. The area that I'm showing in the, with the cloud around it, we're going to zoom in on that so I can, you can see what we're talking about as an example. Um, but what they've shown here is where the proposed, uh, you, you can see it's the Holcomb Boulevard, which is the road running north-south on the west side. And then these proposed new streets are the ones that are shown here gridded within the area of the cloud. When you zoom in on that area, what they're showing here is the proposed grading for the site. They're going to be doing some required street improvements on Holcomb Boulevard, which is going to include sidewalk, curb, gutter, widening of the pavement, and that sort of thing. So there's some trees growing along there that are all numbered, and they're all proposed to be removed. Mm -hmm. um, and mitigation be required if they are not dead, diseased, dying, or hazardous. And then on the south, property line, or that property line on the bottom of the screen anyway, you have an area where they've identified a, a row of trees that are not within a construction area and can reasonably be preserved. And they're going to, they've proposed to put a protection fence around those. The protection fence has to be put in place, has to be signed, 
has to remain for the whole construction period from grading through certificate of occupancy on any, on any houses that are built out okay. there. Um, and the Public Works Department is out there making sure that those tree protection fences are maintained during the course of construction. So that's kind of a typical situation. They're showing the new lot lines that are going to be put in with the subdivision. They're showing where the 10-foot public utility easements are going to be shown on, on those lots. But you can see that there's going to be a lot of grading. There's going to be a lot of site work and public facility construction in this situation. Hmm. So the reason the trees on the bottom of the uh, graphic here don't have to be tampered with is they're not within the grading profile. Is that they're not within the grading profile, and they're not affecting any building footprint. We always condition the application. This is a preliminary approval. We will always condition an application to provide a final tree plan when it goes to Public Works for grading permits. So that, and if it looks different from this, then we we're going to change the number of mitigation trees required and follow through with that. Mm. Mm. Uh, mitigated trees, uh, you know, I assume some of the plantings I've seen at schoolyards and so forth are part okay. of that mitigation. Mm. Um, Is it all on public land? First priority is planting on the development site. So they okay, what protects the tree when it's planted on the development site from the future? Yeah, we require a covenant that's recorded with the lot, and so it fall, it runs with the land, and it's part of the. It's going to show up on their. And, and if that tree is removed, then it has to be. Deceased. Yeah, um, and so the property owner may or may not be aware of that requirement yeah. because they may not be reading their title work when they buy the house but you know they know there's a tree planted there they know there are trees planted in the yard um, we do everything we can to notify them um, if a tree is removed there may be a complaint um, oftentimes they will record a separate HOA covenant but that's not enforceable by the city what is enforceable by the city is the steed restriction that we require. And um, that would follow mitigation requirement here. Um, and it's the number of mitigation trees varies from lot to lot based on the lot size. Um, so this is the table in the code um, that specifies how many mitigation trees are required for based on the size of the tree removed. So when you're Removing trees from outside the construction area, um, hypothetically, you can avoid those. So the number of mitigation trees is higher if you have to remove them uh, based on the diameter. In column two, the mitigation requirement is slightly lower because it's within a construction area. Does column one produce, produce a uh, encouragement to not <laughs> See too many trees removed outside the construction corridor. Yes, yeah, because I mean, you go back and you can see here yeah. if if um, the trees on the south on the bottom of the property are being proposed to be preserved, if they were removing those, you know, column column one would kick in and require a much higher number of mitigation. And we've can, seen, can you use your uh, as, uh, if you use a mouse? Do we get it on the screen as opposed to the red oh. light? Sorry, what do you mean, Doug? Sorry, uh. can you use a mouse on the on uh, on your actual screen there? And uh, uh, see, we can see the, we can oh, see the mouse. You can't see the. Oh, yeah, we can okay. see the mouse so on our on our screens here. Where, sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So there would be column one mitigation ratios required in this area if they were had X's on these. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's an area that's not in an easement. It's not in a grading area um, but that's based on the arborist assessment yeah. mm -hmm. the, uh, the number of ones <clears throat> being removed I guess due, due to road work on the left margin they're right. all very systematically the same distance apart aren't they yeah I mean Real they tight. could be I'm not sure what the species on these were because they didn't cross-reference oh. 
the numbers with the table. Oh, it, it's a no it's, a, it's a it huge look like a set of you know, plants. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's planted buffer there. Yeah, it could be arborvitae yeah. that have grown yeah. up, or yeah. Leland there cypress, or something like that, yeah. or, or some other uh, screening type barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so that's the table. Summary of this code is that it attempts to balance the right to develop land to an urban density on zoned land within the urban growth boundary and requirements for clear and objective standards for residential development and non-residential development, the need to fill and site grade and provide public infrastructure improvements to city standards and still achieve some tree canopy goals through extensive replanting. What, is the, what it what does is the not do again? yet, oh, pardon? What is the canopy goal again you're trying to achieve? Well, we don't have one because we don't have a city uh, tree canopy um, uh, plan in place now. Most cities in the Portland metro area somewhere maybe. Um, Seems like that's between an easy one for a twenty to forty-five <laughs> yeah. percent. You know, it Lake like Oswego is somewhere like around forty percent. We were right around twenty-five percent. That just yeah. it seems like I was just talking about. It seems mm -hmm. like that's an easy one for us to advocate for, and help you lead. It's an easy one to advocate for. It's a is tough that, one to implement because of resources. Right. Yeah. Depend, mm -hmm. Depending on where things are getting planted, uh, yeah. this came up when we were doing our interviews to actually have mixed stature canopies. I mean. More, more like a natural setting. Oh, staggered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've yeah. Heard of that. So, you know, what I've kind of pointed out was we did try to build some incentives into the code, but to be honest, we haven't seen developers use those incentives in terms of lot reduction and setback reduction and that sort of thing. What we have seen is a significant amount of uh, mitigation trees planted with tree covenants and. I think the biggest issue for most people is the fact that we're not preserving large mature trees through this process and that's the significant loss um, so um, there's a you know that's something that has been discussed before at by the Planning Commission by the NRC and by the City Commission oh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. somehow cutting down a huge tree and planting Five or ten or fifteen little poles just doesn't do the same thing. Right. So um, other cities have different regulations, um, and they have uh, you know a fairly fairly strict process where a large tree has to be preserved to the extent practical, unless and I think they they struggle with that because of development pressure. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that section of code. We have some. The other two. That was all Enrod. That was. That was Enrod and trees. Yeah, we did not. I haven't presented the geologic hazard overlay review yet, right. and I haven't presented the street tree code yet. Okay. So if you'd like me to go on with those, I can. Well, I'm. Yeah. I'm going to suggest we mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. We don't have that many people here. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest that we go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, it's already would have would have been three, three been three hours for me if I got here on time. But if, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, if that's okay, I, because yeah. there's a few things I want to bring out in yeah, some sure. of our general discussion. So, is there anything? Is there anything else that we need to cover at this point? Um, no, I mean, I'm happy to go over these other two presentations at a different meeting. Yeah. Um, item 4B coming up on the agenda is the discussion of the Kanema wetland, but you've already right. been through that fairly, and, fairly right. big. What item 4, if you want to move on to that, I'll briefly discuss the exhibits I included. Okay. Um, so uh, we've talked extensively about the city's mapping pro program. Um, the DSL um, issued a letter to Chris Staggs uh, saying no longer in violation. Um, and, you know, there is a map associated with that delineation, which, uh, according to the DSL, is good for two years. Um, so 
basically he could apply to the DSL for whatever permits are required within this two-year period. He would also have to fulfill our requirements as well. Um, so, And then uh, I've included Paul Edgar's comments from, uh, from the 14th of September. Um, and I included the uh, comments from the Godwins um, where, where they have uh, included a map with the historical channel with the water with the water tanks that flow into that property and their concern for the for the stream resource there as well um, I assume the mm -hmm. I'm sure the waterworks themselves are part of the historic overlay piece are they protected um, yeah, I think Paul probably wanted to come up and talk a little bit more about that because you know more about it than I do, the historic aspect. Yeah. There's mm. no inventory for them, like, yeah. but yeah. we can work on that. Yeah, no. see, the, the, key, no. the, the key to it was in the national nomination document that went into the federal government to get Kanema uh, registered as a national registered district. It talks to and of this wetlands and of the uh, Kanema Waterworks. Hmm. But it doesn't identify them. It, it identifies the location. Oh, it does identify the location. It, within that document. So that document is pretty specific about identifying the exact location of that. And so for it to not be identified then on our mapping we felt was kind of yep. here one hand knows it's there and it was all the, all of that document documentation was generated by the city and uh, at, at, as part of that process and then it did then it somehow it got left off and so what we're hoping for was that we would uh, I just come back and thought, well, this is waters of the state now, according to DSL. Uh, what type of setbacks, in, but are there from it? And right now, our hope was that there was some type of setbacks on it and that there's, and again, we can identify where the water goes. And we know where the water goes because of the contour of the hills, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the, the that's there and so we just would love to see some way to to uh, to get it uh, brought into the mapping and c into the identification right i'm just bringing it up here on the screen it's on it's in your, it's in your agenda so you can see those those, those four tanks up yep. there i i uh, i took a, a, a committee member jerry herman up there we walked up to the tanks so he could physically take a look at it and it's not yeah, I, and I've seen them before. <laughs> Far up into there, and then then when you take a look at at the way that the the water's flowing out and then goes down, and so all of the gray areas over there, in yeah, right in that area, that is uh, that's where the guy was where they're doing all of that leveling. Right, right there, and they're they're running a cat through that whole area, and. And you see the wetland de delineation right through there, and and I, you know, you just get concerned that sure. when we don't have anything, go uh, kind of legally identifying it within the city mapping, then it's a free for all, and uh, uh, that's what's happening, you know. And so uh, uh, it would be. How do we uh, kind of bring it under some type of uh, uh, reasonable oversight and uh, and know that in there there's uh, in that wetlands there's all sorts of uh, uh, one of the uh, neighbors down there had uh, has a frog that comes out that's quite large. If it's, it's quite been, large, it's not native. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he's got it named because it sits there and croaks. Giant. <laughs> and it's been Goliath, living well. Goliath, we'll, try, we'll try to get a native snake in there to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, 
it, <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some type of uh, uh, Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, see, I see I, you, you, all you, of the line coming out of it, where the water is coming out of that pond, out of that last pond, going down the hill, and then going into the wetlands, creating that pool all the way down there. And right in that middle of those of the area, yeah. the gray area, they were running cats through it. And it's but it's not the guy up there that's that's the other person. This is the an existing Paul homeowner. Mm. So, so this this map we have in front of us with the cross hatching and the blue and then the gray. What's the cross hatching and gray signify versus the blue? <coughs> is that a delineated edge? Uh, that that's basically habitat area. I mean, this 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 is not this is not part of the this is not part of our wetland inventory piece. No, nope. this was this is this is what preliminary this site plan Kenema. that the guy was starting to look at um, before he um, as a potential. Where did he get this document? Um, I think he went to the neighborhood association and discussed okay. his development. So, as so, a requirement, no. right? So the nope. waterworks mm -hmm. is a historic resource within a historic district. He, is, it, is that correct? You no, know, he he did not come to us uh, with this map at our meetings oh, and, no. until after the fact. Well, we had a pre-application conference with this yeah. guy. He yeah. had a pre-app, yeah. and mm -hmm. we don't know mm -hmm. in the neighborhood about pre-applications. Right, because they're and not so, formal land use well, applications. Well, they're public record. And you don't, public record. But, but yeah. you, you, you don't have a land use request from them yet, is that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And so was the stop order, work orders put on this front? No. Nope. On this piece? It's been released. There was, and... Uh, right. Once they complied with the erosion control, right. right. then, then they said, you know, you you're okay. It just seems like your historic designation, your district, this is listed, if you said, referred to in your historic district establishment document, that's a good case to come back, I would think, to the city but, and ask uh, that the historic review board function take a look at these um, waterworks. They have a, I, it's the, been brought to their attention. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to speak for them, and I'm not the expert on it. Um, right. Sure. But... Um, I know there was a thought to do an inventory for it because there's not an inventory and get that going. And, okay. and historically what's happened is, is they, the, uh, the developers go in there first with their cats and then ask questions later. Well, they haven't done it here yet. They did it. They, they did it. They started, started there doing their waterworks. It. They haven't. Well, no, no, he's not talking no. about that. No. But other, you know, whenever they want to, then they'll take a fine or excuse or get a stop work order, but they've, they've done the damage. Right. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, and, I was going to show you the actual delineation map. Okay. Um, hmm. This is what DSL has approved. Oh. Hmm. Now, was what is that relative to the uh, to the area he was talking about? Miller Street here, and then you know you, I think this is uphill. It's very steep, and this that's yeah. going up to the waterworks. So it's actually flowing down into the right this, into there, and then okay. through here. And so this is the area you're talking Th about. That house yeah. right there, that lot right there to the to the left. Or that house that's where they've been the water was going still going that way and that's the lot that they were doing in fact they've cut a uh, up the hillside which is real steep right through the right-of-way they've gone clear up the hill and created a, a motorbike path about 20 feet wide cutting all the trees out going up a very steep hill to run motor uh, motocross up through there and again uh, no one in this and part of that would be the fifth avenue right of way and they've got an, a motocross path through that and again these things are happening and uh, was there a code enforcement complaint on that no because it, I have to still live in the neighborhood without being shot they could be anonymous I'm just and uh, I, all I can say is, is boy, it would, it would be so much simpler if we, 
if we had some way that we could, where people could be more respectful of this, and, and I, and it's just, it's tough. I, uh, they, the, I had some people wanted to lynch me in the neighborhood for for just trying to protect water. Yeah. Well, the, uh, yeah. There's a public education component to everything, right? So, I mean, if people know about it hopefully they will comply uh, if, if they know about it and they don't choose to comply there's not a whole lot we can do about that but, well, I, yeah. uh, I I can't yeah. be the neighborhood policeman I right well you're doing a pretty good job you really are <laughs> <laughs> my my question would be I didn't quite understand why DSL doesn't require a buffer you guys require mm -hmm. a buffer around these natural resource areas why don't they yeah that's a good question um, they regulate the wet part, okay. the hydrology, what's underneath right. it, um, you know, and then they leave it up to local jurisdictions to regulate around the edge of it in most cases. And the, each city is a little different from what I gather. Uh, so, is well, there a state agency dealing with state lands outside city yeah, jurisdictions? Yeah, waters of the state. In particular, yeah. would they go to the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service for that help? Uh, I don't know, Jerry. I, I guess it depends on the extent of the wetland and what habitat is associated with it. With it, whether it's actual uh, fish fish habitat and, and that sort of thing. Um, well, they, they've mm -hmm. done this. This is really a well mm -hmm. <laughs> studied little piece of land here. They got photo points and everything else. I mean, anybody that does anything outside what they're supposed to do is in trouble. <laughs> uh, I can't mm -hmm. imagine going up the hill. Anybody right, there is the a hill, report. There's a full report with this. It's about 76 pages long. Really? Yeah. You know, wow. and, it, and it's based on what the applicant hired a consultant to delineate. Okay. And then they accept that delineation. Uh, okay. If, yeah. Yeah. But this is very binding, is my point. You, you don't fool with this thing. Binding for two years after which, you know, it probably, if they do anything else, you know, it, the existing conditions change they want a new inventory yeah. but isn't mm -hmm. it true now that the state uh identified this and delete uh, identified the delineation that is now on the state registry as a wetland it, so it's you're right you're right yeah and their uh their letter which i'll put up here Look at that. Uh, investigation determined the wetlands under proper state subject to a state removal fill permit. However, the work you performed as of July 13th was outside the wetland. For this reason, we're closing the above, above referenced enforcement file. Please be aware that activity in waters of the state may require a permit from the department. You may still need to contact the Corps of Engineers and or city county for their permit. So this is a very snapshot in time type thing. You know, if there's additional work and a violation beyond what they've already delineated, then, you know, there's a new enforcement requirement and somebody needs to be out there doing it again, at least in, uh, but they would probably rely on the current delineation to enforce it, so. I guess my point is that your neighborhood group initiative already has brought attention to this at a high level state agency. And now they've mapped it. They've determined photo points to monitor it. The uh, wells that you're concerned about on the hillside above, I can't imagine them getting in there and messing with those. But, you know, it'd be nice to have them on the historic inventory. They are. And then, huh? They're on the inventory, but they're not listed right. on the map. Yeah. But you've made a lot of, of uh, you've accomplished a lot. That's yeah. my point, you know. Yeah, he's accomplished a lot. The point is he, we don't, we don't, have, a, we don't have a buffer along the, Buffer would be nice. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah. It would be uh, how it would be sure nice to have some type of buffer along all the whole areas, every the every air, so that we have something that we can kind of hang our hat on without being that's developer, regulatory. Is the developer open to having a community group come in and help them establish a buffer? This would be a great scout project. Great. 
for you know, well, next fall. Wait, the legal uh, legal buffer is not the same as somebody coming in and doing something. I mean, yeah. then that, that's the point. I mean, okay. It's not, it's not going to be on the same map by bringing some group in. Uh, okay. Yeah. But you could accomplish the goal. I do want to say that fortunately this is rare, um, us to find features outside of any mapped overlays that yeah. have never been mapped in yeah, an overlay true. district. This is the only one I can think of. Yeah, me too. Um, mm -hmm. That's never been in an overlay district that we found. Right. When the city did the jug handle road improvement project in 213, everything that was inventoried touched or was partially in an NROD boundary and so subsequently the NROD boundary had to be remapped to take into account all of those areas and new impact analysis based on that new boundary <laughs> which is m m the more typical situation and it is rare to see something like this yeah so what would it take to take action to have a buffer on this area I guess his request is can we as put forward our goals is to have the city to actually take a look at this and see if they can find some money to do it. And I'm getting your feedback and saying sure you can. Yes, you certainly can. <laughs> yeah. as from my well, we'll do that. We'll do that as part of our goal. You'll do your request. That would be wonderful. Yeah. 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 That's that good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. That would be that would be a wonderful touch to it's just, it's just that we're looking at something a little bit broader in terms right. of our yeah of our, I, our mapping I mean, citywide yeah okay all right okay well, <coughs> thank you Sorry. is this the end of this one thank I'll you. go home yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but we're some of these other items we won't be going through you guys today. have accomplished a lot though don't think you haven't I mean this yeah. alphabet soup thing drives me crazy too I mean, the Corps of Engineers having jurisdiction and state lands is enough of, of a confusion right there. <laughs> well, I'd like to have somebody explain that sometime. Well, I would. I would just like to make a comment. When I, two of the people back there, the guys, are one has a, uh, I think, a master's degree in in uh, timber, or, but he's worked for Metro for years in in uh, managing natural areas. And he owns one of the houses right now, right there. And I would love to try to see if we could get a, a, a Metro uh, Nature in the Neighborhood grant to go through and clean, clean up all of our right of ways. We have these, we have, let's say, 20 to 21 feet of pave, pavement in a 60 foot right of way. And the rest is garbage, and blackberries, and ugliness. And what I'd love to do is go through that whole area of of historic Kanema and really try to beautify and clean up all of those areas and do it in a in an appropriate manner and I and I was talking to them and I says you know you guys are uh, this would be a, a, a wonderful touch where we go through and really do a, a cleanup of Kanema and all of this wonderful resource that we have this beautiful I think I think if you get your neighborhood association to make the request, there's a greater opportunity. You I think you them. can call Metro and talk to them as well. Yeah. You know, and and ask them whether they think that that would be an appropriate grant. My guess would be it would be, but they might give you some tips on how to write it up so that it that you would get well, funding. I would suggest you get the neighborhood association to deal with it because you've had run-ins with Metro for reasons. Uh. <laughs> so it'd be really good if you got the neighborhood association to submit it. Oh, I that's, think we can do, do it, and, I, and, and this is uh, this would be so positive for yeah. for the environment and everything. Well, I, I, I think it. I think my personal feeling is that when they get a neighborhood making a request, it's a lot yeah. more effective. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. You, you bet. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And Thank you. I just sent an email to code enforcement. To oh, look okay. at the um, track door. in the right of way and then that property next door. Yeah. So. Okay, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, Laura. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Appreciate it. Sorry about the blue screen. It doesn't seem to want to turn off the projector. <laughs> oh, that's pretty. I like that. That's pretty neat. Oh, now it's oh, off. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so 
Next so what are we uh, what are we taking on to the next meeting then? Since we, we don't have a quorum, we'll need to table the approval of the NRC work plan. Of the okay. yeah, um, but one wanted to discuss with you the upcoming city commission meetings. <coughs> upcoming what? Upcoming city commission oh, meetings okay. where we have opportunity to present. I, I want I want to I want to delay it enough that uh, we can have a joint meeting with Parks and Rec if we can do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, they <clears throat> when do, when are they going to come to their goal setting session? Do you think? Uh, the city commission. Yeah. January. Sorry, the retreat is in January, but for the yearly update thing, that's a little bit different. We have uh, December seventh open for you. Um, if you want to come and um, talk for you know five to ten minutes about um, all the great things that NRC has been doing this year, but the the goal setting session is in January, right after um, the new year. What day is the? Yeah. I think we should seven. do December. Just because it's a Wednesday. Is that a Wednesday? Um, the December seventh is a Wednesday. It's yeah. a, the city commission so hearing. The first is a Wednesday, what time? also, isn't it? Yeah. So make our presentation then. Seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We can do that. I think it'd be best um, because I, I've watched these goal settings in January, and then there's so much material that you guys are all staff, all departments are responding to. You can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> yeah. You really can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get our goals established in time with Parks right. and Recreation to they have a joint meeting on that. Um, um, I, I could make. I guess I could make my general co uh, comment uh, that I made to the Planning Commission in terms of uh, wishing to uh, revisit our our inventory and uh, in the timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll look for a little bit of guidance. Can I uh, indicate this as an example where uh, we'd like to see uh, a, a potential delineation made uh, by the city itself? Um, yeah, so you can have your list of requests. Um, ideally, they would have some type of component so we would understand what the staffing need or budget associated with that would be um, so they would know how to allocate things differently. But mm -hmm. Anything you want uh, to request, you can. Um, I would suggest doing it in writing rather than, I mean, you can talk about it in your yearly update. Right. But, um, I, my, my question is that, whether I bring that up in terms of our goals, other than the general request to take a look at our uh, wetland delineation, and not our wetland, de 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 well, our wetland overlay again, based on new wetland, wetland delineations by the state. It's up to you. Um, this is your time to toot your horn and say all the things that you've been working on, and this is one of the things that you've been working on. Yeah. I, I think it'd be wise to let the group just have in their hand the assembly of things we worked on for the last couple of years that Pete put together. Not to go over it, but just here's a sample of all the things we've done. That would be really meaningful for them to see because it's pretty impressive. Yeah. What do you think about that? You, I think it's a yeah, a necessary exhibit to what you present. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. You can you send me another copy? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we can even add to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to we be honest get with you. The word, the word version of that. Yeah. So our meeting on the seventh will be here in the city commission, making a presentation. Somehow soon, I'd like to see us uh, invite um, Phil, Phil Lewis, to come see us, the head of the oh, right. Parks and Rec and everything. Yeah. Because I think he wants to do that. I've been talking with him. And yeah. I, think you'd like to develop a better relationship with us? No, but then we've discussed that at the Parks and Recreation Committee. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when will we do that? For a January meeting? Uh, Not December, I guess. Huh? The, the, thing, the thing is, they, uh, yeah. we, uh, uh, they, saw, they saw our work plan here. Okay. They, they saw it at the last meeting. Okay. Uh, they'll, they'll probably be developing one of their own. Okay. And... Uh, Probably they ought to develop one of their own before we have our joint meeting. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I just meant inviting him to come see us. And sure, sure, that'd be fine. Yeah, that'd be fine. No, I think it'd be great for 
everybody immune. Right. Okay. And then the other thing I was going to suggest for, for not December, because December's out now, but January would be John Runyon give us an update on the uh, <clears throat> Lower Harbor Trust Fund enhancement the focus code. areas for yep. the code. That'd be fine. Because I think he's got that work done. Okay. Okay. John. All right. Um, and... And, and one more for me. Lastly was my outline for walking tours. I really want to do that. <laughs> I've talked to Dottie. She's interested. I think Doug is too, and perhaps our other committee member here, getting the outline going and figure out when we would do these in 2017, walking and strolling tours of three or four different districts. Laura is what we're talking about. Riverside Walk, Bluff, John McLaughlin Promenade Walk, station ourselves on a particular Saturday quarterly, shall we say, at the Falls Overlook to give interpretation to what's going on there from a natural history standpoint. And then the Cove, as the Cove becomes more accessible. It isn't very accessible right now, but, no. <laughs> you know. Is this something all the NRC would be involved in? Or yeah. Just, uh, anybody that wants to be involved, I would like to put together the, uh, with anybody that wants to work with me, the outline of what we would talk about. I, we probably need to pilot test it. Uh, as an idea in, in a given area, my suggestion would be the Bluff Overlook, John McLaughlin Promenade, because you can see from the elevator to the falls in about a 4,000 foot walk, mm -hmm. quite a lot of area. Okay. History, natural history of the mountains on the other side, Pete's Mountain, to many other things of the river corridor, et cetera. So you would hold your NRC meeting as like a walking meeting? Kind well, it'd be for the public to come and join us, yeah, and learn about the natural environment. Uh, we did a bus tour. That was nice, but buses take effort and money and all that. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is simpler, I think, and gets yeah. us directly Great involved idea. in doing the interpretation. Mm -hmm. I also think it's fundable with tourism money from the county, small grant program, mm -hmm. if we ne needed whatever, promotional literature or something. I don't know what we need, but, you know. Okay, so that would be... I'd like that... to see that in January. <laughs> on the work plan? Wait, 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 well, wait, I'd wait. like to see it on the work plan. I think we did put it on the work plan. I okay, passed yeah, all I out. I think we but, did. But I'd we like to see We didn't prioritize it yet. We didn't prioritize it. No, yeah. I, I, under communication, I think, is where it kind of fit. Public okay. communication or something. Yep. But I'd like to see more detailed discussions on that in January, personally, just because it's going to get lost otherwise. Okay. Okay. Well, those are, those are two major things for the January meeting. Yep. So I'm not sure we're going to schedule anything else there. Um, okay. and, and also inviting uh, Phil Lewis to speak yes. to us as well. You're right. You're correct. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's fine by me. Any other things? We were having a meeting in December as well, though. Uh, that's a good question. It would be, uh, you know, December 14th, uh, if we have an action item to discuss. Um, in terms of what we've discussed tonight, and our recommendation for uh, members' I interviews. Um, uh, how, does, how do your boards and committees typically make the recommendations? I, I, now? I would suggest that even if it's a short meeting without much of an agenda, I would suggest we have one. Yeah, okay. and, uh, and, and so we're able to forward right at the beginning of the year our recommendations for, for mm -hmm. the new members. True. And, and it might be just that short of a meeting. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and the other thing that would be coming up potentially in January is a presentation on the Riverwalk concepts from the Riverwalk project managers for Willamette Falls Legacy Project. For, for our meeting in January? Uh, yes, tentatively. And I would suggest taking one of these things that we're putting forward and do in December if we can. Okay. Well, I, otherwise, yeah. January is going to be so low. December 14th. I didn't think All you were right. going to have a. I thought you had the first of December on a Wednesday. The second Wednesday would be the seventh. You see. So I didn't think that the 14th would be our normal meeting because we meet on the second. Right. Yeah, second Wednesday. Second Wednesday. Second Wednesday. So, but if we're saying we have a meeting on the 14th, I'd like to deal a little bit with the idea of the walking tour then and get it out of the way. Well, so, okay. Yeah, uh, that, that's fine. Yeah. What I wanted to do. Or if, if we're getting a pre presentation on the river walk, okay, and you've suggested uh, several other things, and we get the presentation, the presentation on the river walk would be done in January. Then, if we deal with one of his other yeah. agenda, that's yeah. fine. No, yeah, that makes that's sense. Fine. Yeah, and so 
the 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 meeting we'll, we'll have we'll have discussion about the uh, the nominees for the filling of the positions. Okay. Sure. And then we can have the uh, the well, we're uh, discussion how we do the first walking tour yeah. test and things like that. See what might work. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. I can't tell if I, I see your illness or you had a question. No. I, okay. <laughs> oh, I, I, want, I was thinking I, I, that you I were going to get her home and get do her your meeting. And I thought, oh, stick, her, kind of stick her in there for a week so she <laughs> no. gets feels better. You're good. Um, um, uh, are there other, uh, any other points of business at this point? i got a couple things I want to address. Yeah. Anything? I have some updates for you. And your I have sure. to get up at 4.30 in the morning, so oh. you're like way past my bedtime now. Yeah. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's actually 9 o'clock. I know it is, but that's when I go oh, to bed. Yeah, I'm usually in bed at 9 o'clock. 4.30 yeah. is really Speaking early. of the Riverwalk, we have an exciting event that we would love for all of you to attend. Um, so it's going to be next. It's going to be on the 17th, and it's going to be at the college, and it will be the afternoon through the evening, so about 3 to 8.30. And we have some designs. We're paring down what this river walk will look like. Uh -huh. And we couldn't Keep be more tuned. excited for it. We want to get input and sort of figure out as we keep refining these plans, are we moving in the right mm -hmm. direction? What do we prefer um, sort of trade-offs and things like that? It will be an open house style. Um, we're hoping that we get a, a good turnout. There'll be work sessions as well. So you would sit at a table, um, sort of restaurant style. You'd walk up to a table and you get to play a game. And it's a fun game and it provides input for us or lets us know how you value things. In particular, there's, um, you know, do we value natural resource areas over other things or development or what does that look like moving through the phases of this project? And so um, we would love for you to attend. And um, if you want to, you can even volunteer to be on. Um, help us with um, manning the stations and so forth. I have a sign-up sheet right. for you or anybody okay. else that would like to I help. submitted something that I got online. All yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell everyone you know. We want to get really good input. We had 800 people at the event in March. And um, I don't know if we'll get 800, but we sure hope to get as many as we can because this is such an important project. It's a great reform, right? Yes, it yep. is. Okay. And we want to make sure that we get it. What day it, of the right? week is that? Um, it is the 17th of March, or I'm sorry, of November, which is a Thursday. That's next Thursday. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Um, no, then, then there's another one you're having on the 16th, too. Is that right? City Commission. There is a city commission on the 16th. Oh, okay. There's only one forum for the river walk, which okay. is on the 17th. Right. Yeah, somehow I got two different dates that came into me, and I wasn't, I was confused by it. Okay, very good. And then there's also this Friends of Trees planting that we have. Um, so please. December 3rd. December 3rd, please help us um, volunteer or sign up for a tree. Trees can be planted in the right of way or on your private property. Uh, meet Saturday, December 3rd at 9 a.m. at the Zion Lutheran Church. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be in the McLaughlin, Barclay Hills, and Rivercrest Neighborhood Associations. So you saw last year, um, a big thanks to Pete for curating all of this. Um, we had the planting in McLaughlin and Rivercrest neighborhood, and we were doing it again this year, but we're also expanding to Barclay Hills because we want to make sure that people have a longstanding relationship with the trees and that they really understand the maintenance and that it's not a we're here one day and we're gone and we never come back. Friends of Trees does a good job about um, following up after the trees have been planted to make sure that we're caring for them properly and we really want to create that stewardship for trees, particular no. street trees. Now are trees. these on private properties as well as public? It can be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so I would take the opportunity uh, at each of those sites to uh, inform people about our Heritage Street program too and make sure that every opportunity we get to get that information out there. That's a good point. Um, and then we have a new planner, uh, Trevor Martin, who's joining us from Yakima and he'll be our preservation planter, planner. He started at the beginning of November. Um, he'll be your what? Our preservation planner. So he'll be the one that will be in charge of our preservation program. So he'll be running 
the Historic Review Board, and um, he'll be getting to work on the um, inventory form for the waterworks. Mm, very good. Yes, we're welcome. To, we're happy to have him. Hmm. Good. Uh, a couple pieces. Uh, any? Is there anything else yeah, from anybody? I have um, the Saturday. We're starting Saturday institutes up at the Environmental Learning Center, continuing the idea of, of not just cleaning up, but now we're going to start salvaging plants. There's a lot of plants that we can move and uh, set aside and pot, and we'll be having um, crews of people, just whoever wants to help, plus my youth crew, moving through and taking snowberries and other organ grape and so forth and salvaging the roots and then planting them immediately and getting them ready for replanting on the Environmental Learning Center in places that were not funded under the Metro grant. There's about another <coughs> four acres of land that won't be uh, addressed unless we address it. And so the college is very happy to have us come up there and um, do that work. And the Oregon City Metro Enhancement helped provide a grant to do that. So we'll be doing that every other Saturday through next spring <laughs> is the idea. So I'll bring you more information, see how the first one goes here. Okay. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, uh, I've been in communication with uh, Bill Clark. He still does not know what's wrong with him. Oh, and, uh, too bad. But he, uh, and so he's, at this point, he doesn't feel like he could come, but uh, he, would, he would prefer that we do not open his seat, uh, seat uh, for a period of time. Uh, he's yeah. hoping he'll be able to, yeah. to come at a later point. Yeah. I think he's been a great resource yes, for has. us, and uh, so we... You know, as far as we're concerned, even if he's going to be missing the next two or three meetings, that uh, right. that we keep him on our list. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I hope he gets better. Um, yeah. I, I always have a hard time with his uh, last name, but Roger, who spoke to us from the PRAC in terms of the pesticide use and so forth. Right. He suggested that we uh, invite the. Uh, Mayor of Lake Oswego to talk to us about their Mayor of Mayor Milwaukee, Mayor Mayor Gamba. Excuse me, of, of Milwaukee, absolutely. Yeah. Not Lake Oswego. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, you're quite right. It is uh, of Milwaukee to speak to us, and we there's no urgency on that, but I can make an invitation. Yeah, really good. Really but good. it looks like uh, December and January are kind of full on our agenda, so we right. might postpone it till spring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And his his objective, I think, was to try to share low impact. Um, nature scaping, I don't even want to call it that, uh, methods to impact the environment lesser with landscaping methods, uh, Xerxes society type yes. approaches. Right. Yeah. Now, Metro has a lot of handouts and brochures about how to garden with using natural things yeah. instead of pesticides, too. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's got a, his whole city, I guess, doing that. I'm really into it. Good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Wow, thank you very we'll much. Close. Right. Laura, take good care deal. of yourself. Because I'm sick. I saved my face. <laughs> That's funny. That's what oh. happens when you've been married a while. Hey, yeah. And then your husband will say, "You're sick of me." <laughs> <laughs> I always look like this. Because I work in McMinnville. Oh. And I get there by seven. I have eight o'clock class, so I get there by seven. What do you do in McMinnville? I'm the head of the environmental.